Okay, also willkommen zu meinem Vortrag zu äh, Analyse und Kaputt machen, sagen wir mal so, von simplen, selber gestrickten Verschlüsselungsalgorithmen in wirklichen Produkten, die im Produktiveinsatz sind. Ich bin vorher gefragt worden, ob der Vortrag nicht möglicherweise vielleicht auf Englisch gemacht werden könnte. Hat irgendjemand was dagegen, wenn ich jetzt das auf Englisch mache? Sehr gut. Okay, then welcome and just start, uh, to, to begin with a short intro about myself. My name is David. I finished my master's in computer science from the University of Graz, also Technical University of Graz. And I studied in the field of IT security. Uh, my thesis was about analyzing the advanced encryption standard, which probably most of you heard of. And since 2003, I'm part of the Sigma Star GSMBH, and we focus on consulting and software development in Linux and security. So Sigma Star GSMBH is basically a consulting and software development company. We have a strong focus on the Linux kernel, so we have Richard, who sits somewhere here and has a oh, there, and has a talk later on about the Linux containers, and who is also maintainer of various subsystems of the kernel, and we do a lot of security uh, research and development in networking, uh, audits and reviews. So basically, a lot of things in security. Okay, let's start. The problem uh, with, with we had from a customer was uh, to get the password of a wireless access point. And basically, when how do you start something like this when you have a piece of a, a software or a device? How do you can, how are you able to check if it's secure or not, or if it if it fulfills the promises? With open source, it's easy. You can just look at the source code, you get it, you analyze it. If you have not enough knowledge, then you hire someone, like us, and we do it for you. Or there are public projects like the TrueCrypt audit, which, which was done, finished, I think, a month ago or two months ago, uh, where this is done in public. With closed source, it's harder. You basically have to trust or you start reverse engineering, so you have to get out the hard tools and disassemble it and have to read a lot of assembler code and try to find out what it does. Or with, especially with encryption software, which encrypt files or similar things, you can check input and output of these things. And you can see if the stuff you put in falls out on the other end and looks good. So let's leave it at that and we'll see what I mean with that. So with, with this access point, that's Uh, basically, the, the thing we had from a customer who had like 50 or more access points of this installed in his uh, buildings, and the problem was he lost all the passwords. And so he had the choice to, so we had the choice to drive around the country and reset all of them and reconfigure them, or we find a security hole and break into them, retrieve the password and reconfigure them from home. So that's what we did. Uh, we got one uh, to experiment, we res reset it, we tried it out. We found, first we found a few issues. The first one was this thing has a web interface. You can grab, you can log in, it asks for your password and username. Uh, but it, you can also bypass it and retrieve an encrypted configuration file. So you just open the URL, your browser, and uh, it gives you an encrypted configuration file, which is nice. Then we tried around a bit more, and we found out this configuration file, you can retrieve it if you uh, connect to it through the zero console. Then you can retrieve the file, but you have to know the password for this. And then we saw that it stores the password in plain text. So that's a simple XML file. You can get it, and so we had an encrypted file and we had the decrypted file, but not the one which our customer was using, so we had to break the encryption. And that's what we did. So, and here's how to do it. So when you, when you analyze a system like this, you start with gathering facts. What do you know about it? Is it good software? Is it bad software? So for the encryption, we, we had the 
the two configuration files, the decrypted one, the plain text one, which was a simple XML file, and the encrypted one. The encrypted one was unreadable to us, so we had to find out what we can. The first is, how would you implement it? So if I would have to do this, then I would have to think of where do I get the encryption key from? Where do I, I don't know, which cipher do I use? Um, for the encryption key, there are a lot of options. I can retrieve it as user input. I, I can ask the user to give me a password, use it as key to encrypt the file. I can use some hardware, hardware ID, like a MAC address of some network interface device, or I can use a fixed key. Then you can also analyze the files you have. We had those two files, so I can look at the encrypted file, uh, open it in a hex editor, look at it a bit, find out how the distributions of the, the bytes are, or, and compare it to the plain text file. And you can also try to find out more, like product information, or if you find the, the source code, most of the stuff is based on Linux, so you can ask the producer to give you the Linux sources, so it's GPL, so you can ask for it if you're a customer. We also did that, but it took them too long to give us a response, so we broke it. And then we told them it's broken and they had to fix it. Uh, basically, all they told us was we informed the department in Asia about this issue. <laughs> but I get, I'll get to that in the end. So with the EAP 200, with the, the Enterprise Success Point, we found out if we download this uh, encrypted configuration file, it does not ask for a password. It's restorable on a different device. So we yeah, the first one, if it does not ask you for a password, it's either some fixed key, which is in the firmware, or it's a MAC address or some hardware ID, which is bound to this hardware. But if it's a hardware ID, you can just restore it, this, this configuration, on the same device, and not on the different one. So we tried both of these things, and we found out it has to be a fixed key, because I can take the configuration file from one device and restore it on three different other ones. So the good thing is, if we disassemble the firmware, we have to find the key somewhere in there. But it's a lot of work, and we didn't want to do that. So uh, we started to look at the encryption itself. And also, we know if there's one key, we can use the security hole to get the encrypted file and break all of them worldwide. So whenever I'm at the hotel, I check the wireless access point. <laughs> so, Let's start to look at those files. We created two files, one that's the, the simple one, the first one we created, and then we choose a longer password and retrieved it again. Uh, and we also got the plain text versions of both and compared the sizes. If you look at the sizes, you'll notice, so these two files are the same, this is the plain text one, this is the encrypted one, and these two are the same. And if you look at the sizes, you'll notice the, the following thing. They are connected, and the length of the encrypted one is the length of the plain text one plus 128 bytes. And we tried it a few different times with different password lengths, and we concluded that it's, this formula holds for everything. So with this knowledge, uh, we knew, uh, and a bit of cryptography knowledge about uh, encryption, you know that a few ciphers can't do that. There are ciphers which have to, with, which produce an output which is of some length, and they increase not by one byte, but by a fixed size. Uh, but which are those? So I think we'll just do a short excursion to symmetric uh, encryption algorithms. Algorithms, basically, such an such a cipher has takes plain text, which do you want to encrypt, and a key. And it gives you the encrypted version of the plain text. And there are two categories, the basic ones. I think most of you heard of them. Who hasn't heard of block and stream ciphers? Great. So block ciphers are basically the standard one, like uh, the advanced encryption standard, AES, 
which I think most of you know, or DES, are block ciphers. Stream ciphers are a little less well known, but RC4 was in the, in the news, which is weak, because it was in TLS for quite some time. Um, and all of these algor algorithms have two important properties. One is the output which they produce should be really randomly distributed. So every byte it produces should in, in the file should be about you should encounter the, sa the same byte in no let's say the other one no, no, the other one around each byte should be about should occur about the same amount of times. And the second one is you should take large enough keys. So with AES, it's uh, 128 bits keys, or 192, or 256 bits. So that's a large num amount of keys you have to try if you want to brute force it. And it's not, you won't live through that. When you look at block ciphers, uh, then they operate on fixed size inputs. So AES has uh, 128 bits of input, so that's 16 bytes. And if you want to put in more, then you have to find some way to split up your input and do it multiple times. But if it's shorter, or if the last uh, one does not fill up to the full amount of the 16 bytes, then you have to add some stuff there which is random data or something you chose and you know what it looks like and you remove it when you decrypt it. So that's called padding. And because of this and these modes of operation where you take the first part, you encrypt it, then you take the second part of your input text and encrypt it. Uh, there are a lot of them. Uh, because of that, you always have your output increases in, by a fixed size. So for AES with uh, uh, 16 bytes, it's always 16 bytes, then 32, and so on. So it's never something in between. And so you know, with when you go back to our access point, it can't be a block cipher. So you can throw away a lot of the standard algorithms, which are good and which are really hard to break. So that's perfect. And the 128 <laughs> bytes at the beginning, if you look at them uh, with a hex editor, like hex dump, uh, which is not an editor, but anyways, you see that it looks really like some file header which stores basically some information. This, we later found out, this is the device model, and that's version numbers of the firmware, and that's just some random identifier. And here for the output, we need this later on. The dots represent characters or, or bytes which are not standard ASCII characters. So just unreadable stuff, random. OK, but we still have a lot of options which for the encryption algorithm. So it can be a lot of stream ciphers, which can produce every output length possible. Or it could be some custom, very simple algorithm. So we look at the file contents in more detail. If, if the output of the, also if the encrypted file itself, each byte, if you look at the whole thing, each byte is randomly distributed, then it's good. But if it's not, uh, this indicates some weak, strange algorithm which is not good. Because when you have an algorithm, you design it especially to produce output which, look, which looks random. Because if someone intercepts it, he can't retrieve any information of it. He just sees random garbage. If it's not random, then he can think or he can look at it in more detail and maybe find out some things. So you can do, for example, letter frequencies. You can analyze how often each byte occurs and you can make some nice charts. So if you look at the, some part of the encrypted file and look at it just as ASCII characters, you don't have to look at the bytes in hex or anything, then you see a lot of dots in there, which is strange because if it's really random, then you would have to see a lot of printable ASCII characters in there, like A, B, C, or whatever. And here we only have two, a space and a dash, which is strange. If you take the same plain text file and encrypt it with, let's say, AES, then it looks like this. This, this is random. You 
can, yeah, it's a lot of garbage, basically. This, not so much. So it, it gives us a clue that maybe something is going on there and we can look at it in more detail. So let's do a letter frequency analysis. Let's make some nice charts. Let's take the, the plain text file and let's look at it. Okay, we know it's, it's XML, so there are a lot of spaces and a lot, it's text, basically. The E is very common there. So yeah, standard XML file looks like this. Then you look at the encrypted file and you see this, which is, yeah, it, it's kind of strange because it looks like it's properly randomly distributed. But, so we know it's not some really, really simple like road 13 or something where you just take the character, add 13 to it, and then you have your output. But we also noticed that the output on the most common characters which occur always start with C. So that's hexadecimal, so they all see something, which is not normal for random output. Okay, but let's go back to the facts which we know about the algorithm so far. It's not a block cipher. It's not properly randomly random, a random distribution. And it's not very simple. So it's maybe somewhere in between. So we speculate it's maybe some custom, very simple algorithm, but it's not standard. So they, I don't know, they thought, yeah, let's make something new and it's simple. So. Okay, then let's look at the, let's compare both files, the plain text one and the encrypted one side by side. And maybe we'll see something there. That's the, that's the beginning of both, both files. That's the ciphertext and that's the plain text. If you look at it in binary, which is, yeah, you look at it and you see mm, there's a pattern there. Or at least it looks like it, because the ciphertext is always the inverse, at least, at least for the first byte. Then for the second one, it's also true, but not the last bit. With the third one, it's also true for the first four bits, but then not. And with the last one, it's the first three bits. So something is going on there, but it's not just negate, negate uh, the, every byte and then you get the ciphertext. So something is going on there. So it, let's try an XOR operation just for fun. If it's an XOR and you take each byte, XOR it with some key which we don't know yet, and you get the output of uh, out, output byte of the ciphertext. So basically, you take the plain text uh, and XOR it with the key and get the ciphertext for the full file. But also with XOR, you can take the plain text, XOR it with the ciphertext, and get the key. That's basic property of XOR. Uh, if you do it for our sample, then we get the following. So this should be our key. We try to verify it with a different file, and we see, no, it's not it. It's a different key again, and that can't be it. If they use the same key, which we know from the beginning, it, this cannot, cannot be it. But what about the, the not which we saw here, which at least for the first few bytes seems kind of true? Uh, let's try not P, uh, so PT, the plain text, and for each byte which is this, and the ciphertext, so it should look like this, so which is the ciphertext. So we see the first one, we know it's okay, then for the second one, it's not really okay, but the first part is okay, and then it, it starts to get different. But if we look at the difference, so if we just sub, subtract the one, so we, this, this one minus this one, then we see this, which, does not look random. This can't be an accident. <laughs> so, yeah, well, let's try it. So, I had fun. <laughs> so, let's try it. If, we, if this assumption of us is true, then the algorithm to encrypt it would be not PT, so the byte, plus some key, which should be this. Okay, let's test the first 80 bytes. Oh, it looks good. Produces the same XML file we want. And we see that the key repeats after 64 bytes. So 
it goes to 0x40, then it starts again with 0x00. <laughs> nice. So that's the decryption in Python, which is four lines. <laughs> and have fun. <laughs> now, basically, some uh, thoughts de developers might not have known a lot about cryptography at all, or they did not care. I don't know. Or they thought nobody will be able to retrieve the file because it should be password protected, but it wasn't in our case, which is basically they had two problems. The first one was we were able to retrieve an encrypted file without authenticating to the access point. And the second one is they chose a very weak algor algorithm to encrypt their file. And maybe they didn't think of it think of it, or they just want to obfuscate it and it's not the real encryption, so they never wanted to do that, but who knows. No, it's no encryption. <laughs> it's just obfusc obfuscation. So. But they use it in real life, and this access point is first not cheap, and second one, they, it's really popular. <laughs> so, yeah, they sort of shot about it. Uh, if you want to try it for yourself, I heard this Android app is quite nice and has about the same quality of encryption. <laughs> which I think it's free, but it's one of the top 10 rated apps. So I don't know. A lot of people seem to use it. OK. What have we learned from this? Maybe you should use standardized algorithms. And maybe they are a good idea, because a lot of people put a, a lot of research in this. They really spend a lot of time researching, trying to break it. I think in, in AES, it's like 10, more than 10 years of research now. And there are a few theoretical weaknesses, but not that many. And in practice, you can still use it, and it's good enough. Even there are theories about the NSA here, but yeah, and you should think of all parts of your system, not just the one. You always might find some weak link somewhere in the whole thing. Yeah, and it's fun. So that's it. I think it's a bit short, but if you have some questions, please. So the question was, how long did it take uh, to break it until I knew how the algorithm worked? It was like a half hour to an hour. And <laughs> then to, to write the Python script, because my Python foo is not good, I took another, another hour to <laughs> really get it working. <laughs> Any other questions? Sorry? It was a wireless access point, so it's called, I think it's, the producer is level one, uh, somewhere. It's this one, it's called EAP200. There are a few different versions of it, which all have the same issue. <laughs> uh, so you can do it with a lot of different devices, so it's just, if it's called EAP, you're probably good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, if you want to call it, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you get some feedback, yeah, we we wrote to them and we said, okay, guys, look, uh, this is not what I, uh, yeah, what I expect. And they said, yeah, we contact uh, the Asian development department and they will work on it. We never heard back from them, so we published it. And the other thing was we requested their GPL sources which took them, I think, about half a year or longer. And they published it then on their website. And I think they make a, made a mistake because, because it's not just the Linux sources or the open source stuff. It's also the source code for their web app, 
or web interface. So you can look at it yourself and you can see. I think there's even a comment in there which says it's just obfuscation and uh, to do replace this with a proper encryption. But <laughs> nobody seemed to care. So. Yeah, it, it's something like this. That's, yeah, that's how you do it, right? You add security later on. Yeah, no. That's not the way you should do it. Security should be at the beginning. Yeah, but if you have some of these devices, you can download the source code, get it to build, and patch it yourself. So, Any other questions? OK, thank you. I'll be here the whole day, so if you have any further questions, just speak to me. Thank you. Ja. Aber die Füße sind selber voll.